As always, it is a blessing to be here, a blessing to bring God's word and worship the Lord as a church family. Uh, before we get started, I also wanted to remind everyone that on the 29th, we do have a new Bible study series on Sunday evenings at four starting. Uh, it's called Spiritual Disciplines, uh, Pursuing Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And uh, if you're interested in that study, uh, the book is not mandatory, but if you want a book, please let me know today as I'm going to get all those ordered. And so uh, you can mark it on a card, give it to someone, or you can tell me, but uh, let me know today, please. All right. We continue in our series on the church today. If you do have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it to 1 Peter chapter 5. The past few weeks, we have been laying the groundwork for what the church is and who we take our lead from as the church, as the people, the church. Our head is Christ, and it is through him and his word that we establish how we are uh, how we as the church are to function. So today we're going to be looking at leadership in the church and how God gives us direction and how we are to structure ourselves for the benefit of the whole body. It's really important in our lives that we are seeking direction from God's word. It's important in our day-to-day, -day, uh, in what kind of person we are, how we work, what kind of student we are, if we own a business, how we do business. And I think we all would agree with that, that we must seek direction from the Word of God. And so it's essential that the biblical structure of God's church is how He established it, and He tells us about that in His Word. So before we get to our main passage, I want to spend some time just looking at what what does godly leadership look like? First and foremost, and we see this at the end of the book of Hebrews, where the biblical writer is about to talk about Christian leaders in the church, and he begins with this in Hebrews 13, verses 7 and 8. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He starts by saying, remember your leaders, the elders, the ones that have preached and taught you God's word. And the thing is, his reference here is most likely referring to leaders that have experienced the ultimate glory and are no longer with us. But regardless, we are being instructed to look at their lives and imitate their faith because leading with God's holy word is a huge responsibility. If they live lives striving after Jesus, imitate that faith. Take note, it does not say imitate them. It says imitate their faith. Meaning, follow Jesus the way they follow Jesus. Because if in their faith they were striving to be like Christ, then it's really Christ you're imitating and who you should imitate. And I think that's a wow moment because it's a big deal. It's a big calling for leaders to live lives in such a way that their faith, that the words and actions they put out should be imitated. But then the writer does something interesting, because when we look at those two verses, it seems like, well, it's like he's, he doesn't have a thought process going here. He, he says this, and then boom, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. No, what he does here is he takes our focus right back to where it should be. God in his infinite wisdom, knowing how human leaders are only capable of so much, points us back to our ultimate leader, our high priest, our king, Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning his leading will never end. So at the end of the day, when earthly leaders fail, and they do, and they will, and church leaders fail, Jesus does not. As much as we are to hold up our leaders in the church, follow them, encourage them, pray for them, submit to that leadership, 
at the end of the day, it's still about our ultimate leader, Christ. So, the events of our lives are often uncertain, but Jesus is our true constant today, tomorrow, and forever. Everything else changes. Jesus does not. So with that as a, a backdrop, godly leadership sees God's word as authoritative in our lives. That's why Paul exhorts Timothy to teach, correct, rebuke, encourage with the word, because sound doctrine is important. And what does he tell us? People often won't want to hear the sound doctrine. And another point we see in Hebrews 13, it's in verse 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they will keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. This is quite a command. And so what God is telling us in this passage is this. God expects his people to show trust, commitment, and submission to the leaders of his church. The thing is, submitting to something is not easy, or oftentimes not even desirable. Quite often, when I'm doing premarital counseling, and we have to start talking about submission, I actually had a, a, a bride once go, can you just leave that word out? I said, no, because it's error. The idea here, right, the Christian life is all about submission. Ultimately, submission to God. In our text, God wants us to be submissive to our leadership, and we ask, well, why? Because it's through that leadership that God reconciles his earthly ruling, and submitting to their leadership makes their task more joyful. And that's part of his point. That as the church, we want godly leaders to lead us. It's bad for us. They keep us on track. They'll keep us grounded in his word. That's beneficial for us. God has put into place every person in leadership for a reason, but do not forget, he's the ultimate authority. Romans 13, 1, let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. Let me just throw this in. This does not mean, and I say it again, this does not mean a lack of accountability. Leadership has to have accountability. But for the believer, though, in the church, what we should see in our leaders should be Holy Spirit-controlled men. Now, Hebrews tells us that there will be a day that the Son, the King of Kings, our High Priest, will rule this earth physically. But until that moment happens, God guides and directs His church through the men that He has appointed to lead. So submission to men of godly leadership is not weak or something to frown upon or a hit to the ego, but it is submission to God. And so who is the leadership that He speaks of? It's the elder or overseers. These are to be mature men that are ordered by the Holy Spirit to lead God's church. We see in Scripture how Titus was told to appoint elders in every city. And we see in Acts that they were to feed and lead the flock. And part of this is you can see various structures in churches, but many churches today are led by a larger body of believers and it's just something we don't see in the New Testament. If it was, we would not see this call back in Hebrews 17 to obey our leaders and submit to them. God's authority is given to the leadership under the final authority, which is God and his word. If we have leaders in the church who are not following God's word, we don't follow that lead. That's the accountability. The leadership is to watch over the souls of the people. 
This is not some flippant responsibility, but one that has to be taken seriously because the leadership will have to give an account one day for the flock that they lead. That is the setup for our passage today as Peter exhorts the elders of the church and how they must lead. So if you are able and you're willing, please stand with me as I read from Peter's epistle, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the suffering of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not hoarding it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning just thankful, Lord, to be in your house, thankful to be with each other. Uh, Lord, speak into our hearts this morning. Share your truth of your word with us. Encourage us. Equip us this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. <clears throat> it's always interesting and kind of awkward for me when I have to teach on eldership. Because in a lot of ways, it, it makes me feel like a, a self-serving type of, of message. But it's certainly an important biblical message to us. And even in my preparation this week, I didn't look at this as in terms of how people view me. But I was looking at it of the, the elder influences in my own life that have been so important to me. And that's one of the keys here. And I was just going to share, uh, you know, if people come to me, I just don't know much about this elder stuff. Uh, if, you're, if, you, if you're a reader, a book that, that I would encourage you, who, who does a far better uh, explanation of these things, it's a ben Benjamin Merkel is his name, and it's called Why Elders? Uh, a Biblical and Practical Guide for Church Members. And it's a really great book. It's not very long. And so if you like to read... Um, you can either get this, or I would be more than happy to, to, to loan it out to you. All right, so before we get too far into it, and if you're asking, or what about deacons? We're going to talk about them next week. <laughs> so don't think deacons are getting out of this. But before we get too far into it, let's, let's look at a few quick things about elders. This is a crash course. It's not exhaustive. We're hitting some main points. Elders ha had been in place even in Israel throughout the Old Testament. We see a call to the elders as they lead. Uh, they were men charged with leading the people. And when it came to the New Testament under Christ, their role maybe arguably became even more important as they were to lead spiritual lives that were an example to the people in what it meant to follow Jesus. And the first elders were the apostles. And under their leadership, Paul exhorted Titus to begin raising up lay elders in the churches. And we see that in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, where it says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed. If anyone is uh, above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. And as I was reading that, if you're like, well, I think you hit some of those. Um, this isn't about perfection, right? We're going to get into that. But for this reason, the intention was for each church to have what we would call a, a plurality of elders. Every time you see it used in this context, it's in the plural form, and it's specific to individual churches. And so that, that's my firm belief, that churches should have a group of men called as elders to assist, and lead, uh, to assist the lead elder or pastor in shepherding the flock. And an elder, an overseer, 
would be a man that was seeking after the Lord, growing in that relationship, a shepherd of the people. That's what we see in Hebrews, right? Someone who is going to give an account for the leading of the flock. Under, remember that. There's going to be a day when I'm standing before the Lord and I have to give an account for each of you. So remember that when you're dealing with me. Make that easy. That was self-serving, I'm sorry. One thing we must know is that great importance is placed on the elders in Scripture. It's a great responsibility, and the quality and calling for such individuals is of high importance because of the responsibility. It's not a position of, you know, you know let's, let's give them a chance. They, sh they should get a shot at it. That's not this kind of position. That's why we call it a calling. And it's something we see immediately here in 1 Peter 5. Was it? Peter begins by exhorting the elders of the churches. And he says this as a fellow elder and someone who was there with Jesus. There's his qualifications. Right? After Jesus ascended back to heaven, he sent his spirit to empower the church with spiritual giftings. And part of that was to gift men to shepherd his flock that he left until his return. So one of the most important functions of an elder has to do with what he does for the people. A biblical elder shepherds God's flock. Theologian W. Philip Keller, in his book called uh, A Shepherd's Looks at Psalm 23, says this, It is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of a sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose. They require, more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. And that's why we see in one of right, the more known psalm passages, Psalm 23, a reminder to us that the Lord is our shepherd. Because when we're left to our own devices, we don't do so well. We saw that in Amos. We see that throughout the Old Testament. And that is where God raises up elders, and they have to take their example from him when shepherding the, the church. Right? Being involved and in the business of the flock. That's what Peter's continued call here is. I remember someone once told me, well, my personal life is none of your business. Not when we're Christians. We, we're supposed to be all up in each other's business. Because that's how we lead and how we guide each other. It's not because I want to know what you're up to. Right? How are we doing? And that's what Peter's talking about. And he, he goes on uh, to say how elders are to do this. So when Peter says, not overseeing out of compulsion, the Greek word for overseeing or exercising oversight is episkopeo, which literally means to have scope over or to look over. John MacArthur tells us, shepherds must watch over the sheep to assess their condition so as to lead, guard, and feed them. And that's what Peter's exhorting here. He then goes on, and he says, Biblical elders should be godly examples. Peter says, being an example to the flock is imperative. We're not going to go into it today, but when Paul provides... The qualification uh, for elders in 1 Timothy and in Titus, he generally lists things that are to provide an example, right? What does he tell us? To be above reproach, to be faithful, to be temperate, 
to be self-controlled, to be respectable, hospitable, gentle, not quarrelsome. And here it is. It's not that an elder is, to, is, is perfect, because they're not. It's not that they're not going to fail in some of those areas. They will. It's that they are striving for them every single day to be an example of the Lord to the flock. And when they do fail, they own up to it. They seek forgiveness. They repent. They embody Colossians 3, verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. The idea here for an elder is they can't just roll over and say, well, I'm a sinner, it happens. No. It's truly striving for an exemplary life that is defined by God. It's not easy. The temptation is hard. But it cannot be a crutch or an excuse for an elder. There has to be a sense of brokenness. At the end of the day, as you look back on your day, are you broken? I can tell you, most days, I look back at all my failure in that day. That grieves me. How did I fail as a believer? How did I fail as a husband? How did I fail as a father? How did I fail as a pastor? I'm not going to wallow in that failure. But it should be something that strives to push me to go, you know what, I'm going to try harder tomorrow. That should be a heart of an elder, not going, well, oh well, they had it coming. Some do. And on the other side of what an elder should be, Peter also here is issuing, uh, issues warnings of what they shouldn't be. Right? Going back to the idea of exercising oversight. Right? He says not to do so out of compulsion. His point here is to do it voluntarily or eagerly. And what this is saying is a biblical elder must be a willing, hardworking servant of God. He's getting at there's no room for laziness they must be heart motivated in faithfulness not forced you don't want an elder who gets up and goes well i have to do this today they should be passionate about the privilege of the office not indifferent to things When, the, when an elder is seeking the Lord, nourishing that relationship with Jesus, the overflow of their hearts, lives, actions, that is what you should see from their life. You shouldn't have to beg an elder to be the way God wants them to be. You shouldn't have to come up to me and go, well, pastor, please, we really need you to be more gentle with people. Or, or, or pastor, you know, we would love it if maybe you open the Bible every now and then. Some don't. No. That should be the overflow of an elder's heart. It shouldn't have to come from some form of motivation. I said I was going to get to him next week, but that goes for deacons too. 1 Corinthians 9.16 tells us, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. That is the elder's responsibility, and it should be seen as joyful. Joyful. 
It's also why elders or overseers are given the task of being able to teach when it comes to their qualifications. Right? God's word has to be of utmost importance in the life of an elder. It's not, can I teach? It's, I desire and I want to teach God's word. Once again, going back to the idea, you shouldn't have to beg an elder, you know, could you teach this, 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 this Bible class? You shouldn't be, well, if I have to. No, you should want to. And it's all according to God's will and desire. Something else that Peter warns the elder of, and it's not to do this for monetary gain or, or material benefit. We, we see elsewhere that elders are, are, are to be selfless servants, sacrificial in nature. We, we, we see this growing, growing, growing trend over many years now of the prosperity gospel. If you're not tremendously familiar, it's, it's where you're watching them preach and they're like, and if you would just send us a, three easy payments of $9.99, you'll be healed. That's not the motivation for a biblical elder. It's not about money. It's not about status. It's not about grandeur or fame. It's about the gospel. It's about, at the end of, of the day, am I making myself more known or am I making Jesus more known? And the last warning that Peter gives is the temptation to dominate our Lord over others with the position. And you might, well, how does that? It happens very easily. The last handful of years, I've seen pretty prominent preachers who have pretty successful ministries fall from grace because they dominated their congregations. They didn't lead them. And it's because of this, oftentimes I see churches afraid to structure their churches under the leadership of elders for that reason. And that's what Peter's warning of here. For elders, a life of humility is what is required. We don't shy away from biblical practice because of fear that someone will misuse it. Because understand something, people always sinfully misuse things. It goes back to accountability. And for elders, they need it. We live in a fame-induced culture. Now more than probably ever with the internet and videos going viral and TikTok. Who uses TikTok in here? I want to know who you are. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be ashamed to raise your hand, Kim Vanover. I see you over there. <laughs> Pastors, elders, overseers, it's all the same. Need accountability because of the temptation Satan will put in the path at times for them to elevate themselves. John actually mentions a situation like this in, in 3 John. He talks about handling it. But Jesus even talks about it in Matthew. He tells us in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28, he says, Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It's about sacrifice. An elder, as much as he is a leader, 
He's a servant. He jumps in when things need to be done, equips people for service, but he's also doing it. And Peter makes this strong reminder, and this is key, because the flock really doesn't belong to the elders. They have been entrusted to them by Jesus. And that's why Peter then brings it back to this focused truth. Elders are under-shepherds of Jesus. In verse 4, he, he reminds the elders, one day the chief shepherd will appear. If you're following him, treating his flock the way he'd want you to, you're going to receive the blessing and the reward. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25 tells us, do, not, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. It's not about props and pats on the back and good sermon accolades. Those are nice. And I, I would even say appropriate from the church. But for an elder, they cannot be the motivation. It's about an eternal reward. The reward given by God, which is ultimately salvation. And going back to Hebrews, the job of an elder is serious. It's a sobering responsibility. Because an elder will be held accountable for how they lead by God. It's not something to take for granted or to approach casually. Which is why the writer of Hebrews exhorts the people to pray for the elders. Because of the immense responsibility of carrying the message of the gospel and the truth of God's holy word. I hope you know how serious I take that. But also know I am not perfect. And I fail. But the moment that the word of God becomes unimportant, no longer fit to be your pastor. And that's the truth for any church who walks through the doors. If you walk into a church and all you get is a motivational speech, and they never open up scripture, and they never read it, that is not a church you want to be a part of. The job of the elder is huge. That's why the men chosen for the position have to be properly tested, making sure it is a calling from the Lord. The elder must be gospel-focused in everything. Because at the end of it all, it's not about church politics. It's not about getting your way, filling the seats, making sure we make budget, which we need to. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That has to be our motivation. It's interesting um, that generally, sometimes it doesn't happen. On Sunday evenings, we sit down with our kids and the older two have to talk about the sermon and what they got out of it. It's cruel. It's punishment. Um, that's where I get my ego boost. Not really. If anything, they bring me back down to earth. But it was an observation that my son made. And he said, Dad, you, you end your sermon like the same way every week. I was like, you're right, I just copy and paste. Because if I preach from the word of God and we never talk about the gospel, I've missed it. Because it's always about Jesus. 
because that's who we need. As important as elders or pastors are and deacons and, and ministries, and without Jesus, they don't matter. And it's the one thing that I took away from my first youth pastor position is every week the senior pastor ended with the gospel. Because that's what's important. That's the saving message. We need Jesus. Those around us need Jesus. And as much as we're striving for holiness, as we should, and to be examples of Christ, they need to know the message of the gospel, what saves them. Every one of us that knows Jesus as our Savior had someone say, this is the truth. This is what saves you. Some of you probably even remember that specific person's name. We need to share it with people. We need to be engaging people with that message because that's why Jesus came. He came to be a perfect example of us of what we should be striving for. But he also came as a sacrificial lamb to pay the penalty that we cannot pay. As he died on the cross, took on the full wrath of God for sin and defeated it. And he tells us, when we say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you, I believe that you did that, we're saved. Remember, there's not, it's not, there's not some magical prayer that I can just recite up here, and if you repeat it, you're good. It's if you truly believe in your heart, you're saved. Because God sees into the heart of the person. I implore you, though, if you're sitting there this morning, if you're watching online, and you have never given your life to Christ, you've never said, yes, Jesus, I believe. I believe what you did. I believe that you're my Savior. I pray today is that day. We talked about submission. Pray that you say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you submit to his lordship in your, in your life. Because it's about our need for Jesus and living a life worthy of his sacrifice that brings us salvation. Biblical elders are charged with leading people towards that when the flock has a tendency to wander. There's a line from a wonderful hymn, I'm sure we know it, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. An elder has the immense task of leading the people towards steadfast faith, assisting them to plant their wandering desire. So then we can sing the next line. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Let us be in prayer for the men God has called and established in this role. Every morning on Sundays I come in and I pray for pastors and elders of churches that are leading. I pray for my friends who are preaching right now because the immense task that has been laid before them. Let's pray also that God raises up men that he is qualified for the position. God has blessed his church through elders that lead biblically and submit themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ and answer the call to tend his flock 
until his return. Let us be thankful. Let us praise him. And let us pray for them. In your name we pray, Lord. Mm, amen. Let's pray as a church. Father God, we come to you this morning. We come to you now with thankful hearts, Lord, for your word. Lord, for, for the men, which I, I'm sure many of us in here can, can look back on and say what a profound impact they've had on us. Elders that you have called to, to lead. Lord, be with us as the church. Be with us as, as we seek to, to be everything that you've called us to be. Lord, I, I pray for, for, for the men who, who might feel that calling of, of eldership in their life, Lord. I pray that, that you continue to guide those steps. Lord, I pray for us as the church as, as, as we surround such men that we love and encourage and pray and even hold accountable. Lord, I pray for biblical pastors and elders in our area who seek to lead their churches according to your holy word. Lord, I am thankful that you have provided us with scripture that tells us exactly the things we should be doing, the truth of, of, of what you would want for your church. Lord, I pray we never take that for granted. And Lord, I pray as the church, Lord, I, I pray for me that we are examples of your son, Jesus. That we are seeking to be gospel-focused. That we are, are seeking to share your son's saving message with the people around us. And Lord, we pray for those people. We pray for them. That they hear the gospel and that they respond to it and they say, yes, Jesus, I thank you. God, I pray for that. But Lord, I do pray for us as the church that we're willing to take those steps and say, I need to talk to you about something, friend. It's the good news for the reason. Let us share it. Lord, be with us as we wind down our time this morning. Lord, I pray that you speak into our hearts and that as we leave our, this place today, that you invigorate our soul. That there's an excitement as we go from here that we want to tell someone about your son. God, we thank you and that we love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.